an enormous honor to introduce one of the world's iconic leaders of urban environmental transformation, Peggy Shepard. Her work in the 1980s demonstrates clearly how a local response to environmental pollution affecting a predominantly African-American and Latino community in West Harlem ultimately led to the creation of a highly effective advocacy organization. She co-founded We Act for Environmental Justice in 1988 that has grown to have offices in New York City, New York State, and Washington, DC. We, in fact, heard a lot this morning from Sonal Jessel about how WE Act does it all, research, advocacy, policy briefs, testifying, and impacting broadly the conversation around environmental justice that can have enormous national and international impacts. WE Act just demonstrates the power of community-led solutions. In addition to WE Act, Ms. Shepard serves on the executive committee of the National Black Environmental Justice Network and the board of advisors of the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health and was the first female chair of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council to the US Environmental Protection Agency. She has been awarded two honorary doctorates, one from Smith College and the other from Lawrence University. Listeners, feel free to put questions into the Q&A during the talk, but we will hold questions until the end of the presentation. It is now my great pleasure to turn the virtual podium to Peggy Shepard. So good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you today uh, to talk about climate justice in New York City. And uh, I'm sure many of you all remember, or hopefully <laughs> you did not experience this particular moment uh, out at our ocean front, but so many New Yorkers uh, did experience that. But I'm going to start by giving you a sense of the organization that I work with and in the community uh, just south of the Bronx uh, in West Harlem. And uh, this is a photograph of the North River Sewage Treatment Plant, which was the first big campaign that um, I began running as a Democratic district leader in West Harlem uh, in the late 80s. And this plant was a prime example of environmental racism because it was originally cited for the uh, West 70s boat basin. And a number of developers got together and lobbied the city planning commission to move the sewage treatment plant further uptown. And so it was moved to um, the Hudson River between 138th Street and 145th Streets. And to sweeten the uh, the challenge of hosting this plant, a state park was built on top of it. And so Riverbank State Park is probably what you're most familiar with. It is on top of this plant, and it is one of the most visited uh, parks in the state park um, uh, affiliations. So we act for environmental justice. We got started um, campaigning around this issue. We got started in 1988, primarily as a volunteer organization. And then in 1994, after we filed a lawsuit against New York City, uh, and our lawsuit was settled for a $1.1 million West Harlem Environmental Benefits Fund, uh, we were able to get a grant from that fund to hire our first staff. And so, we were founded in 1988 to institutionalize advocacy in a community that had never had advocacy around these issues. And in fact, most communities of color have very few advocacy organizations. We have a lot of social service groups, but we don't have organizations that are engaged in mobilizing community for civic engagement and for power. And so our mission is building communities, um, healthy communities, uh, by ensuring that people of color and low income can participate in the creation of 
fair environmental health and environmental protection policies. So how do we do our work? Um, organizing, advocacy, research, education, and training. These are our methods. And right now we have more than 800 uh, WIAC members living in Northern Manhattan, uh, the Bronx and Brooklyn around the city, although mostly in Northern Manhattan neighborhoods. Um, we meet monthly on the second Saturday of every month where we talk about issues, our state or city policy uh, and how members can, can be involved. We, despite the monthly meetings, we also have community working groups. We have a working group on climate justice and one on healthy homes, looking at the indoor environmental health issues that impact so many of our families and especially now that we're more indoors uh, because of COVID. So education and training, it, it's not enough to organize residents, they've gotta be informed because if they're going to be the ones to tell their story to the media, to elected officials, they have gotta be informed. It can't be just about the emotion because we know that that's what, um, that's how we're sort of stereotyped. Oh, those emotional community folks who don't know the facts, they don't know what they're talking about. So we make sure that our members do know what they're talking about. And so we have an environmental health and justice leadership training program um, that can, um, if you do the full program, we have over 30 climate and environmental topics. Um, we run it for eight to 10 weeks with a a certificate to those who graduate from the program. And we're also able to curate it. So for instance, if Lehman College wanted to do it for its students, but you only wanted to do say two hours or you only wanted to, um, to do it around um, you know, climate justice or um, you know, energy issues, we could curate it to, um, to just do workshops um, for the issues that you're concerned about. And so we do that um, in a public school in uh, Washington Heights called the Wheel School. And we run uh, every spring semester for a week um, in that school, we run the environmental health and justice program for 90 students. And then after the students um, have had that program, um, we hold a social justice expo where they develop their own projects and we um, invite people from around the city to judge those projects and we give awards of uh, several hundred dollars to the, to the top three projects. And that's great fun. You know, we have all of the kids, uh, you know, coming for the uh, presentations and awards in the um, auditorium and they're screaming and clapping for their friends. It's just a, a, a wonderful, wonderful day. So uh, we look forward to getting back to that um, once we can be in person. We also are very involved in community-based participatory research. For the last 22 years, we have um, had subcontracts at two research centers at Columbia Mailman School of Public Health, where our job is to translate the research into policy. And we have um, been very effective at doing that. We have developed um, probably five to six pieces of legislation we have supported uh, at the state level around toxics, around chemicals and children's products, uh, flame retardants, um, a whole host of, uh, uh, of legislation. Uh, also with the city council, we have been involved um, in lead poisoning legislation to protect our young children uh, from this neurotoxin. And you probably know there's just been a scandal in terms of the city not, um, not identifying uh, lead, lead poison children, especially in public housing and private housing. And so uh, my staff, and I think you heard from Sonal Jessel earlier, has been working um, with a round table of, of uh, lead, advocates, lead advocates in the city, uh, working to uh, support about 10 new pieces of uh, lead legislation to close all of those gaps that, 
that we've seen. And then in terms of advocacy, again, focus at the city, state, and federal level on policies that will um, make our lives healthier. And so some people might say, well, you know, I'm used to groups that do organizing and I'm used to groups that do policy, um, not so used to groups that do both. And we understood very early on that yes, we can organize residents to, um, to, to raise the issues that they are experiencing, but we can only begin to provide some solutions if we're also helping them focus on the kinds of policies that we need and educating our elected officials to develop and pass those policies. And then also we have been very um, involved in leading the national environmental justice movement and very involved in movement building. How do we develop the capacity for hundreds of environmental justice groups like ours around the country? Because no one group can do it alone. If we don't have a strong movement of other groups with capacity, we will not be as successful and effective as we might be. So we spend significant time um, helping to build other groups capacity. We have an environmental justice leadership forum of over 50 grassroots groups around the country uh, across about 29 states. And we work with them to bring them to Washington to meet with their elected officials, uh, help them understand some of the um, very complicated energy and climate issues that are arising every day and emerging. So these are our focus areas, clean air, climate justice, healthy homes. How do we use our land so that it's sustainable? Uh, equitable transit, open and green space, waste, pest and pesticide reduction, toxic products, food justice and water quality. Now, of course, we don't work on all of these areas um, in any one year, uh, but we do prioritize um, these particular areas uh, over a period of time. And of course, some, some issues are more ripe um, for, um, for advancing progress on than others. And then some issues um, come to the forefront of community concerns uh, more than others at particular times. So that's how we think about prioritizing and listening to community members about their real concerns. So we understand that um, environmental justice communities are the same that are the hardest and first hit by climate change. And we know that through numbers of studies, including the International uh, Panel for Climate Change, that low-income communities of color will be the first and worst hit by climate impacts. And, and we've seen that, we see that every day. We also know that between 2000 and 2012, nearly half of New York's heat-related deaths were among Black Americans, despite the fact that they comprise less than 12% um, of the population. Um, and that's part of what we call the urban heat island effect, that because of the built environment, because of tree cover or lack of tree cover, because of permeable surfaces, sidewalks, because of building materials, that some blocks from block to block in the same neighborhood could um, be at 10 degrees higher or less uh, than other blocks. And so again, uh, really figuring out how we develop cool cities, cool roofs, um, and really um, work to ensure that we have the green infrastructure in place uh, to keep our communities cooler will be very, very important as we move in the future, because even though you think about climate change as sea level rise or wildfires, he, extreme heat events will be happening every single year. And we know that our climate is getting hotter. And we know from studies that we're experiencing more uh, days of over 90 degrees uh, than we have in other years. So again, we know some of these issues again from Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina, 
in New Orleans and certainly Superstorm Sandy here in New York City. In fact, in New Orleans, we understand that Hurricane Katrina not only flood, you know, what you saw, the floods and, and people being stranded and having to be rescued from their rooftops, but we also saw how it really led to social disintegration um, with much of the population, much of the low-income population having to evacuate to other states. Many of them never returned. In the meantime, public housing being torn down, not necessarily being built back. And many homes, um, because of whether they, people could prove that they held, held title, whether people could show that they had insurance, um, did not get the money to build back better. And so New Orleans is a very, very different city than it was before Katrina, because it totally disrupted civil society as it was known then. And now we've seen climate gentrification um, come in where you have more affluent people coming in, buying a property uh, that has been left behind and creating a very different society. And so we're seeing that in New Orleans. We certainly don't wanna see that here in New York City. So Superstorm Sandy, very disruptive here in New York City. Um, some of these photos are from Coney Island and Red Hook showing the devastation uh, that took place there. Again, um, here's bags of food and people made homeless who lived in public housing. You know, a lot of our public housing is at the waterfront because when uh, public housing was being built um, in the early 40s and 50s, uh, waterfront property wasn't, um, you know, sort of the affluent place that people wanted to, to locate to. We had a working waterfront. Um, and so a lot of public housing was built there. And so we see that public housing folks were most impacted by the storm surge uh, from Superstorm Sandy. And here you have people who had to line up for supplies of food, uh, stand in long lines, stores were closed, grocery stores were closed, pharmacies were closed for people who needed emergency medicine, uh, subways were closed. So people living in some of these areas were literally stranded um, and cut off uh, from the rest of the city for a number of weeks. Many people were out of electricity um, as well. So elevators, if you lived on the 20th floor and you had some disability, um, people were really, really challenged um, to have a, a healthy life during this particular time. So as a result, we realized that um, it was just timing that meant that the Bronx or Northern Manhattan wasn't hit uh, by some of this uh, extreme weather from Hurricane Sandy. And so we realized that we needed to develop a plan. And I believe that every community board, every community should have a climate action plan. So we developed um, a process. Um, we work in four neighborhoods in Northern Manhattan, East, West, Central, Harlem, Washington Heights, Inwood. And so we recruited 200 um, people um, and 400 people overall at the end of the process to come together in workshops to understand what, what climate um, issues could impact them and then to understand how they believed that they could address those problems if they occurred. And so we developed a Northern Manhattan Climate uh, Action Plan. It included recommendations for policy changes, local actions that could mitigate environmental impacts, while also really addressing the systemic racism that has really led to that disparity in political power for communities of color, um, especially when we're also trying to confront 
the, uh, the imminent effects of climate change. And so this is a photograph of just one of our workshops where we had people at tables listening to different scenarios and coming up with how those, um, how they could work in their building or their neighborhood to address those scenarios, and then how the city uh, could do their job. So um, this I know it's very hard to read, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how um, we were able to uh, hire an urban planner and really visualize the concepts that the community came up with, whether it was solar, um, more energy efficiencies, um, green infrastructure, more tree cover. Um, we kind of laid all of that out in this visualization. And it's also on our website um, for those who might want to take a um, closer look. So what are some of the health impacts that um, that we are focused on. And again, you've heard me uh, mention the urban heat island effect. And we understand that that's going to be uh, the annual uh, extreme event that we have to address. And so we have developed um, a three-year program to help find solutions to extreme heat uh, and those inequities that make it more dangerous for our community. We have a project to improve New York City's cooling center program. Um, many of you may know that um, if you had to go to a cooling center, um, is it gonna be open? Um, it, is there any water and food or anything there for, for me to leave my home and go um, in the heat, <laughs> walk through the city and to, in the heat to find a cooling center? So we're working uh, to make those recommendations. Um, I believe we've got an upcoming um, focus group and, and workshop uh, to, to get community um, recommendations around those centers. Uh, that program is um, administered by the city. And again, because the cooling center program is a volunteer program by organizations that have a certain space, um, again, it is not as, um, as responsive a program as we think it could be uh, if the city was uh, requiring or financing uh, these organizations to provide uh, this kind of service. We also understand that the HEAP program, which is the Home Energy Assistance Program, um, traditionally in New York City and New York State, those funds have been used primarily for heating for low-income families. We believe that those funds should also be used for more efficient forms of cooling. And that does happen in other states uh, in this country. It has not happened here in New York City. So we are working to increase the overall funding for cooling through weatherization um, and other kinds of funding programs. And we also are working at the federal level to um, ensure that uh, there are increased funds for, for cooling. Um, we were able to, to make those recommendations that air conditioning is almost a prescription. Um, and one of our, um, Patrick Kinney, one of our uh, partners who uh, used to be at uh, Columbia Mailman School, basically said, Air conditioners are a prescription for those um, who are more vulnerable. And so we really need to be able to fund the purchase and, and installation of those air conditioners uh, for vulnerable populations. And so the city did take up our recommendation during COVID because we understood people are going to be at home. And then once the summer came last year, we said people are gonna be sitting at home, um, mandated to be at home, and they're going to um, be subject to intense heat. And so the city began to give out air conditioners. Um, they had a very complicated process. And so not enough air conditioners got out to enough people, but at least it was a start. And I'm sure the city has learned um, 
to have a more streamlined process in the future. We also have to think about land use and sustainability when we're thinking about uh, climate resilience. And so um, we had a waterfront uh, on the Hudson waterfront that um, was a parking lot for Fairway Market. And um, here's a photograph of, of the way it used to look. And we've got um, a bunch of our members who are out there uh, celebrating because the city um, committed to building a park there. That park opened 10 years ago and it's a beautiful facility, small, one acre, but a beautiful facility for families to recreate. Um, and we have never had that equity on the uh, Hudson River waterfront. Millions had been put into the Hudson River Esplanade downtown while we had a parking lot with our peers having fallen to the water. And so we were celebrating that the city made that commitment. And now we have a, a beautiful park. And again, those parks are very important in terms of climate resilience and um, absorbing uh, some of the, um, the storm surge and flooding uh, as well. There were other parks that had solar lighting that while the um, street lighting in some communities had gone out uh, because of power outages, the solar lighting um, still provided some support. So our parks and waterfront access is very, very important to the sustainability of our communities. And then I'd like to just talk about East Harlem. Um, we worked for two years with the community there to envision an action plan for the East 125th Street Transit Hub. So as many of you know, um, Metro North uh, brings hundreds of thousands of, computer, of commuters uh, from upstate New York. And many folks from New York City go upstate uh, for jobs every day. Um, we've got the Lexington Avenue subway line a block away from Metro North. And now we have the Second Avenue subway um, with its terminus uh, uh, there at 125th Street. Yet that whole commercial corridor is something you want to avoid. Um, it is environmentally degraded. Uh, homeless people are not well treated and they have nowhere to go, so they are there. Um, lots of drug rehab there. Um, the area is not conducive for small business folks. Um, and so you really have the dichotomy of a uh, rejuvenated 125th Street in central Harlem with lots of tourism, restaurants, money coming in to that community. And then uh, those tour buses turning and going back downtown when they get to Fifth Avenue, because it's so decrepit um, once you go past Fifth Avenue over to the Metro North area. And so we are working with the coalition to ensure that the city and the state delivers in their promise to reinvigorate that area and to uh, commit money, the mayor's just committed money to the East River Esplanade that have been badly damaged uh, by Hurricane uh, Sandy as well. Renewable energy is crucial now as we transition um, from a fossil fuel account economy to a renewable uh, economy. Um, that includes a just transition for workers as well. And so as, a, as an outcome of our uh, Northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan, we were really surprised to find out that the priority that the community um, decided on was solar and um, better energy because they had been so impacted by brownouts in the, in the past that really killed um, the economy of our small business uh, community. Um, even at, at Columbia, um, the power outages, they hadn't been prepared and many hundreds and thousands of samples were destroyed when the refrigeration um, again had no power. So our community really thought about energy and solar as a priority. And so we started 
a free worker training program to train underemployed members of the community as certified solar installers. We've installed 415 kilowatts of solar panels on the roofs of 11 affordable housing co-ops across Northern Manhattan. They're called HDFCs. Um, and HDFCs are formerly uh, buildings that were in the New York City HPD till program. And that program evolved to allow those tenants to purchase their apartments. And so they're now called HDFCs. And so, you know, there's a lot of discussion, obviously, about gentrification in our neighborhoods. And we believe one way to keep housing affordable is by keeping energy affordable. We do know that in the transition to a renewable energy economy, that in some cases, for some time, energy bills may increase. So how do we ensure that the most vulnerable communities, the most vulnerable residents are still able to pay their bills? We already know that 30 million households nationally are energy insecure. They cannot pay for their energy costs, their electric bill, and pay their rent and medication and all of the other bills they have to pay. So we believe that this is one way to keep affordable housing more affordable and eliminate tons of greenhouse gases and create job opportunities. So as a result of developing um, our worker training program, um, training hundreds of, of young men and women and seeing the fact that they are competing for a handful of union jobs. We found 10 of our uh, trainees who decided to fund, fund their own solar cooperative. And we were very happy that we had them trained through the workers cooperative run by Omer Freya in the South Bronx. He has been running that program for uh, over a decade, probably a couple of decades at this point. Um, and our folks were able to go through that program. They are now incorporated. We help incubate them in our offices. They have just completed a major, um, in fact, he, the photograph at the bottom is the solar array that they just completed over something like nine acres in upstate New York. And so they are well on their way to beginning to make a profit for themselves and to bid for jobs, uh, become an, uh, a minority business enterprise and really begin to um, advance their work and their own personal uh, economics. So we think that solar cooperatives and worker cooperatives are an important way to go, especially for the underserved um, people of color who are not able to get those so-called good union jobs for a variety of reasons. And some of that is racial bias. And so I think we're going to have to develop alternative ways for our workers um, to, be able to, um, to be able to find work and to sustain that work as well. And recently we, we released a green jobs report um, that offers recommendations on how to diversify the renewable energy industry which is primarily right now all white. Again, we have started a project called Community Power, and it's a community solar project at NYCHA's Carver Houses in East Harlem. We have completed um, solar panels at Carver Houses, and we are now um, working to do what we're calling community shared solar. So every rooftop cannot accommodate solar, yet um, that can be a small, a microgrid that allows others to share the, in that solar energy. And so we are now recruiting people in East Harlem uh, to take advantage of being a part of community shared solar. We've also been very active in the Renewable Rikers Act, um, which again is uh, really serves as a model for a just transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. So 
There will be a solar farm developed there. We'll be training people from communities impacted by policing to do solar installation. And we hope to produce enough renewable energy to close the really high polluting peaker plants that are located uh, in environmental justice communities um, across the city. And again, when I say we, I'm referring to a citywide coalition that, that we are a part of. Uh, clean transportation. Um, we've had a dirty diesel campaign that we started in the late 80s that took us 18 years to get the MTA to switch to um, cleaner hybrid uh, buses. Um, and now they are switching to alternative fuel vehicles and investing uh, in electrification. So this was, um, this took place uh, last fall. Uh, that was the first zero emissions electric bus um, in Harlem uh, on the M60 line that goes to the airport. And you also see me there with our former deputy director, Cecil Corbin Mark, uh, who passed away last fall. Um, but he was our policy guru and our energy guru. And um, you know, we were celebrating this first electric bus. And why was that so important to us? Well, in Northern Manhattan neighborhoods, we house over one third of the entire city bus fleet. So out of the, um, when we started, there were eight depots in Manhattan and all seven were uptown. So actually what seemed to be a small um, community problem actually ended up improving air quality all over the city in every single bus. So again, um, don't think that your small community issue is not one that can impact the entire city. Um, and then also we understand that school buses are the dirtiest vehicles on the road and they're holding our most vulnerable uh, people, children. And so again, um, switching to electric school buses and taking advantage of the funding from the federal government and from the Volkswagen uh, settlement to do that uh, becomes very, very important. Let's clean up those buses uh, so that our kids can be healthier. Uh, you all probably know that New York City has been a leader since uh, Mayor Bloomberg in reducing emissions from emissions from greenhouse gases. And that has continued um, under the latest mayor um, and under the city council, which has been um, very, very strong in terms of um, requiring uh, and passing legislation to reduce uh, emissions. Over 80% of our greenhouse gases come from buildings. And so local law 97 requires the city to reduce those emissions 40% by 2024 and 80% by 2050. And so we act help pass intro 1947, which also expands the number of buildings required to comply with local law 97 while still safeguarding affordable housing. We have also um, initiated the Energy Efficiency, Equity and Jobs Act which would ensure that New York State's energy efficiency programs are equitable and provide jobs for our communities. It has passed the state Senate, and we're now uh, waiting for it to, uh, to be introduced and passed at the state assembly. So we're really looking forward to a bill that um, our former deputy director, Cecil Corbin Mark, uh, helped draft um, and we helped implement, and we're very excited uh, for it to be passed. There are also, um, it looks like the Environmental Bond Act will uh, make it into the budget for the state. Um, we're certainly hoping that actually happens. And that Bond Act would, um, again, provide millions for a variety of, of needs in, in New York City, whether it's parks, um, whether it's uh, energy efficiency programs, uh, that will be a, a needed boost uh, to our economy. And I'm going to end up by talking about out of gas and with justice. 
we're working on a pilot program to demonstrate that electric induction stoves and air source heat pumps need to replace gas stoves because gas stoves provide so much indoor air pollution. There have been recent studies by the Rocky Mountain Institute that show that in some homes with gas stoves, that the pollution and fine particulate pollution can be 10 times higher than outdoors, especially for those who are living near uh, highways. So again, uh, we're going to see that in new construction, um, those buildings and appliances will need to be electric. And so we're now doing a pilot program in New York City and with our partners in Buffalo that will demonstrate um, the, in, the improvement in air quality by bringing in electric conduction stoves and, and heat pumps. And again, we're working in a statewide campaign of organizations seeking to decarbonize and electrify homes and buildings throughout the state. And to end up, um, I'd like to say that um, we have been able to pass two bills at the city council that have established in a, the first um, environmental justice advisory board located in the mayor's office. Um, and we, uh, I am chair of that New York City environmental justice advisory board. We held our first um, town hall um, last month. And we will, there's also a piece of legislation that requires an interagency advice, uh, interagency uh, task force of city agencies that will develop environmental justice plans, including climate. And we, um, that interagency task force has also just begun um, a citywide environmental justice study of the issues um, that are challenging uh, environmental justice communities so that those issues can be addressed through city policy. Um, in terms of state policy, we have the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which um, is looked at as a model in the country, one of the boldest laws in the country. And the Biden administration is now looking at that as a model when they say that 40% of all energy investments will go to frontline environmental justice communities. And they're taking that directly from the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which mandates that 35% of all state energy investments go to frontline communities. So those are some of the, the areas of of climate work that we have been involved in. Um, there are coalitions and organizations all across the city that are working on these issues in their communities um, and at the state level. And so please get involved with WE Act, get involved with, um, th with the uh, a variety of, of, of coalitions around the city working on these issues. Um, and, you know, become a supporter. Um, so I want to thank you uh, for the invitation to be with you today. Um, and I look forward to uh, any of your questions or comments. Thank you, Ms. Shepard, for what is almost an exemplary blueprint for effective community action for environmental justice. Um, and many, many opportunities for involvement. We do have a group of questions. Um, let me start with, let me start with one that we actually asked the panel before, which is rarely is anyone's career linear right to where they wanted to go. And what we were wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you got into this space and how you arrived to where you are. Oh, <laughs> um, it, it's probably a great model for students. Um, throughout high school, I just wanted to be a magazine editor. Um, I wanted to, to come to New York City and work for Condé Nast magazines. And, um, and I wanted to write essays in newspapers and, you know, 
that that was what I went to to college at Howard University. I was an English major. Um, and for the first 10 years of my career after school, I worked for the Indianapolis News um, as a, a reporter there. I came to New York City, worked at Time Life Books as a researcher. I worked at Red Book Magazine, Black Enterprise, and Essence Magazines. And just as I was um, at Black Enterprise, uh, I had been hired to start a, the first Black lifestyle magazine. And we were a month away from publishing the first copy of the magazine when Earl Graves, the publisher, decided to buy radio stations in Baltimore instead. And um, they decided not to publish the magazine. And I decided to not stay there in public relations, which was the offer, but to, to move on. And I became a speech writer at the State Division of Housing. And while I was there, um, some of my friend colleagues told me that David Dinkins was having volunteer meetings for the first Jesse Jackson for president campaign. And I should go and get involved. So I went um, and uh, I left the meeting as the public relations director for the campaign. Now, this was the first campaign before there was any money. So, um, you know, it, it, it's easier to have access when, uh, <laughs> when they, they don't have much money because when he ran the second time, he had plenty of money and most of us couldn't volunteer. But that, uh, that campaign gave me the opportunity to go around the city to work with uh, young people. There was something called the Rainbow Coalition um, that, was, that young people were being asked to join um, by congressional district. So every, young folks diverse all over the city were joining this campaign. It was very exciting. It was life-changing. Um, I got to, to go throughout neighborhoods and really see the differences in the communities that had strong advocacy and those that didn't. And so after the campaign, when Jackson did not win the nomination um, and Mondale Ferraro then did not win uh, the election, um, Bill Lynch, who was running the campaign, who was a major uh, progressive campaign uh, manager here in New York City, he died about five or so years ago. He asked me if I wanted to be out front or always behind the scenes producing other people. And so he asked me to think about running in West Harlem uh, for Democratic district leader. And so I ran with Chuck Sutton, who was the nephew of Percy Sutton, who of course was one of the, the Harlem politicos uh, extraordinaire and had also been borough president. And so we ran and won. And uh, one of the first issues that um, you know, members of my club, of my Democratic club brought to me was the North River Sewage Treatment Plant, uh, which was the opening um, uh, photograph that I showed you all. And we began organizing uh, around the, um, the plant. And then you know, once you see the, once you understand and recognize the issue, um, then you begin to see all the other issues. Then we began to see the bus depots and, and just so many other things. But that's how I got involved. Um, I did not have an environmental mm -hmm. background. Um, it's been self-taught. Um, and uh, it, it just says that um, you may think that the job you want today may not be where you, might not be the career you end up in. And of course, today there are careers that weren't even um, thought about or jobs that didn't exist uh, when I was uh, growing up in high school and college. And I'm sure that will be the same for, um, for the students of today. Yes, thank you. That, that is the message we keep hearing. It's not, these are not linear paths and anyone can start from anywhere, any of our students can start from any major and head in this direction. That's right. We have a, a question now really about today. What are your hopes for New York City now that we have a new climate justice friendly federal administration? I am hoping that we will get um, the investment in the underserved communities that we need. 
I'm hoping that we will get further investment in public housing because NYCHA is in a crisis. Um, people are living in totally degraded apartments. Um, it's inhuman. Um, and I believe that um, we will get some investment in our transit, which we sorely need. It's almost bankrupt um, due to COVID. And um, so I, I, I see it in terms of investment. I see mm -hmm. it in terms of centering equity and justice in all policies. And it's going to be up to all of us to ensure that those commitments and promises are met uh, because Biden campaigned on that. He has started out um, appointing diverse uh, progressive people to run his federal agencies. Um, but now we've got to ensure that that, that progress continues, um, that it's not just the first 100 days, but it's going to be um, for the next uh, successive years as well. Yes, we heard in the prior panel, one of the suggestions for maintaining is voting, getting everybody registered and voting. Um, Absolutely. Um, we have just started a C4 organization called uh, We Act for Change. And the first thing we have been doing is uh, trying to increase voter registration in public housing so that uh, candidates will take um, public housing residents more seriously and begin to adopt the agendas that uh, NYCHA tenants have. We have a question uh, asking about high schools. So the, the, the listener asks, I would love to hear more about the work that WEACT does with high school age youth. What have they found to be the most effective ways to engage with that age group in your work? So when we first started, we had a youth group called the Earth Crew, and we had them involved uh, in community-based research and uh, open space development. And we had just a small after-school group of about 15 to 20 uh, young people. And frankly, um, philanthropy wants to see you impacting hundreds of children. And so after about three years, uh, we were not able to keep that funded. So what we have done is uh, done the environmental health and leadership training program in public schools, um, working with teachers. And so we have found that let's go where the students are instead of trying to get them to come to us. And so um, right now our major youth program is um, doing that training program in schools with uh, mm -hmm. science, civics and English teachers. And we'd love to do it in more schools, um, but as you know, working in public schools can be very difficult to, mm -hmm. to, to get into the school. And so you really have to have the teachers who are um, facilitating that to happen. Well, this is a follow-up to how can universities support that work? Because at the university level, you don't have the, the, the childhood issue, right? Everyone's an adult. So That's coming right. in is not as hard. So what can universities do to support your work? Um, they can invite us. <laughs> um, they can, um, you know, uh, ask us to do workshops. Um, although I, I must say, we also need to be compensated for that time, um, it is significant time to develop new curriculum, to administer the programs as well. Um, it, it can take solid weeks of time, um, but we are very happy to do that. Um, we can co-teach um, particular kinds of courses or issues. Um, so there are many, many ways. Um, and of course, um, uh, hands-on learning. Um, there's no reason why students shouldn't get credit to do some work in community-based organizations um, to develop uh, field projects uh, with those organizations. So there are many creative ways um, that universities can engage with community-based organizations and get students out working in their and especially at colleges like Lehman and the city college system, where a lot of students are going to school pretty close to the communities in which they live. 
-hmm. And what better than to have them creating solutions in the neighborhoods that they live in as well? So I have another question that asks you about challenges. What, what challenges are unique to the climate change issue when trying to address environmental justice? And, and maybe even how is the current issue similar to past issues your organization has addressed? Well, certainly a, a, key, um, a key challenge for uh, the 32 years that I've been involved in this has been funding by philanthropy. Um, philanthropy is not diverse. Um, they tend to be risk averse and they tend to think only large national environmental groups um, know what to do. Um, they don't tend to invest in community-based work. They all feel that, well, we really want a national group that's going to improve air quality nationally. Um, but the problem with that is that if you're not working locally and addressing local issues, then you don't get the mobilization of local people for the national work. So why have the big national groups that are sharing $23 billion a year in philanthropy with only 1% of that going to community-based groups, why with 23 billion, had they not been able to develop strong climate legislation at the federal level? Mm -hmm. One reason is because they have not mobilized the regular public. And they have not done that because they don't work with the regular public. They don't address the values of the regular public. If the regular public is still having brownouts, if they're still having extreme heat, if they're still having power plants and highways that are increasing health disparities, they're not trying to tell their elected official to go vote for greenhouse gas reduction. They want reduction on their own block. And so if they see organizations that want them to uh, want their support that are not supporting them locally, they aren't as interested. And so again, if we want strong national legislation, those national groups uh, and philanthropy have got to support what's going on locally as well. That's a great example of how important the local is, isn't it? Um, Absolutely. We have time for one more question I have here. And, and this, this stems from your learning that the local community in New York wanted renewable energy um, as a priority. Do you think this is a priority across urban areas within the US? I do, because energy costs are creating havoc with people's lives. Um, do you know how many shutoffs there are because people can't pay the electric bill? Um, and that's happening all, as I said, 30 million households already cannot keep up with their bills. Um, why did you hear so much under COVID that Biden should do a moratorium on shutoffs? Again, because that is such a big issue all across this country. So yes, um, energy issues are, are so important. And um, we're hoping that the Biden administration um, is, is going to lead the way on those issues. Well, we're out of time and I wanna thank you, Ms. Shepard, for this deeply informative session of how we can advocate for environmental equity locally and more broadly. And I wanna thank the audience for your thoughtful questions. I now invite everyone to the next session, which will be a panel discussion that explores pathways from environmental injustice to environmental equity. Thank you again, Mrs. Shepard, Ms. Shepard. Thank you.